Hi, and welcome to the Intercom Podcast. Uh, I'm joined again by Fergal, and we're going to talk about all things GPT. Fergal, it's been eight whole weeks since ChatGPT launched. Uh, it's been four weeks since the last podcast. Already, people have been building useful products against it, and already we've had a wave of skeptics saying that this is a toy, it's immature, it's not ready for anything ever, uh, which is just classic sort of new tech reactions. Where is your head at? Uh, is the skepticism founded? Like, have we crossed some perceptual cliff that really matters? What's up? I think there's a certain legitimacy to the skepticism, which is that like, you know, th these things are almost natural hype machines. It's just so easy to look at it and see it do something that seems good. And unless you really dig into it, 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 like, it looks wonderful. And then when you dig into it, you're like, ah, oh, it's, it's wrong. I feel misled. So these machines are designed to generate plausible things. And if plausible but wrong is a problem for you, um, it can be very disappointing. So I understand the default position of skepticism that a lot of people come to this tech with. However, uh, you know, we've always been very bullish on generative AI. And I think since we spoke last, we have built some features, we have shipped them to beta, we've had 160 something customers on our beta using these features built in this new type of tech. Um, you know, summarization, some features in the composer, more experimental to try and make people faster. And then we have a wave of other features that are in prototype form that are not quite there yet on like big ticket value things, but we think we see line of sight to that. And so we sort of feel that, you know, we understand the skepticism. We were optimistic and now we think we've got data. We have real customers telling us that there's a particular job that I want to do and that I have to do all day, every day. And uh, it's transformative for that. And so, you know, that to me makes the position of skepticism, you know, start to look a little bit shaky. And the fact that like people are actually literally using the thing yeah. to, to do parts of their job on a daily basis. Yeah, right. So like yeah, that, 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 that's the yeah. ultimate arbiter of this. You know, <laughs> yeah. it, it's very difficult to be skeptical when people are actually using it for, you know, not just for uh, toys. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's sort of, there's, there's a line of, uh, of logic out there. I think maybe we've seen some articles in The Atlantic and places like that where, People are sort of saying, hey, look, um, this, this, this thing is, is more of a toy uh, than a real valuable product. Um, and, uh, you know, ChatGPT as it is on the internet today might be a toy, but that doesn't mean that we can't take the underlying tech and build incredibly valuable business features from that. And I, I think, you know, I, I feel, I think we can say without hyperbole that my team has, has actually been probably one of several teams to, 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 to do that over the last few months and to be like, wow, this is, uh, this is delivering real value. And I, I think maybe, maybe we're one of the, the, the bigger companies in customer service that has like successfully had a, a, a development cycle where we've actually got this in the hands of you know, hundreds of customers and you know, gotten feedback from it. And, and they've really told us, yes, um, th th this, this is really saving me time. This is making my job faster. And so, yeah, the skepticism becomes, uh, becomes harder to sustain. And th that's one argument. And I, I think you can also, um, you, can, you can attack the skepticism from a different position, which is like, you know, we, we've seen a lot of like maybe tweet threads and like articles and they're sort of skeptical about this tech because, you know, the previous generation of it didn't like cross the chasm and wasn't transformative. Mm -hmm. And they're skeptical because new technology is always overhyped and yeah. new technology is always overhyped. But th those are not good arguments. Those are arguments that are like right for a while and then become terribly, terribly wrong. And, uh, you know, you can fail here by, by being over optimistic, but you can fail just as much by not being blank you know, and pessimistic. Exactly. Being blank and pessimistic. The, the parallel you see is like people who like rubbish every new startup idea they've ever heard. And like, the thing is, 90% of startups don't work out. So 90% of the time, you're spot on and you look really smart. Right. And then you're rubbish one that goes on to be a trillion dollar business. And everyone's like, right. It turns out like, you know, and that's the origin of the, I think it's like Nat Friedman said, uh, you know, pessimists sound smart, optimists get rich or something like that. Right, okay. There's some yeah, truth yeah. like when you actually put a weighting behind each of these opinions, the degree to which you're wrong when you're wrong. Right. It bulldozes the degree to which you were minorly right just by being tech skeptical. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um. And you know the 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 art is to uh, to, to 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 try and uh, be be right and be wrong in, in in a weighted sense. And like, look, you know, um, I guess I, I'm a believer in AI and uh, the value of it. I, I think we have enough evidence 
of real value that and you know we've enough evidence so far of real value with machine learning and ai in general yeah. over the last you know whatever decade um we're seeing that like trend increase increase then we've got like you know new capabilities yeah. i think my i feel my team has enough evidence that there's at least some capability unlocks for gpt 3.5 mm -hmm. for other large language models that are new that like weren't there uh, six months ago and uh and you know i i believe there's sort of like you know an overhang there's there's, there's like there's way more products that uh, we could build now that haven't been built yet than there were so yeah so we're bullish and we're, we're starting to see that turn into you know interact with like customers who we ship product to ship beta to um tell us yeah this works this is great and so um you know we aren't we haven't quite crossed the last piece of it which is like and we know this is like transformative in terms of like core value mm -hmm. like for, for the task our customers spend 99 percent of their time doing you know like so we ship the summarization yeah. feature and we ship features to save time in the inbox but we haven't like you know the there's big things I think coming yeah. here that we, we we haven't built yet internally. We're working on, and we haven't seen them yet out there in the marketplace. Yeah. So uh, you know, we think the the real excitement of this is is, is you know is yeah. still coming. There's some hierarchy of like transformation that I'm sure some like HBO or McKinsey person will correct me on in the comments, but it's going to be something like, you know, we're trans we have already put live features to transform specific workflows, and by transform in this case we mean reduce the cost of doing it to like 5% of what it once was in the case of say summarization. Yep. Then there might be like transforming very common workflows. Then it might be transforming the job. Then it might be transforming the org. And then at the very top, it's like transforming the business. But it's pretty clear as we identify more and more use cases where we can deliver a lot of value that we're kind of weaving our way up through this, uh, like to me, inevitable transformation of the world of customer service. Uh, uh, absolutely. And, you know, it, the, 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 there's so many ways that this is changing in parallel, right? Like there's, there's so many uh, dynamics that are happening at the same time here that sort of like are going to feed back and are going to like magnify each other. So the first one is, is kind of obvious, like the technology that's available here is getting better. And that's not stopping like OpenAI, uh, other players like Entropic, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're building new models all yeah. the time. They're exciting. That's not stopping. So that, that's kind of one dynamic. And there's another dynamic, which is like, hey, we're getting better at building products around those. We're getting better at like taking those models and figuring out the type of thing they're good at. There's another dynamic, which is we're, we're getting better at like customizing them, building the right prompts, integrating them into our existing systems. And then our customers, our customer expectation is getting right. higher yeah. and higher. Yeah. And like we, we really found that since ChatGPT, there's just been this huge wave of interest from our customers yeah. where they're like, wow, yeah. I can see the promise. I believe yeah. in something here. And the, the, the beta that we did, um, you know, we, we went internally to our customers and we, we had to like close the beta much earlier, the beta recruitment much earlier than we wanted to because we just got such a huge, you know, one of the biggest responses we've ever got to the beta recruitment. Yes, people wanted to be on. And so, you know, all these things together are going to, you know, magnify like much more than like any one of them on their own. Yeah. Opinion. It's interesting how you like, um, how you break that down. It's kind of like, the tech is improving. Businesses' capabilities to move to tech is improving. And that's just like adopting it in, in like local cases. And then like businesses' ability to like, how would you say, like, uh, like think about or conceptualize new products and new opportunities using that tech is improving. Then yeah. customer expectations of the tech existing, like we're probably only a year away from people expecting to be able to expand on text within a text field. Like as, yeah. as one simple example, like that just might become like you have it everywhere. Your email client does it. Your notes app does it. Notion already does it. Like you're sort of seeing these things that crop up everywhere. Like if, if even a year, I mean, obviously um, a lot of us would have seen the announcement uh, by Microsoft mm -hmm. around uh, bringing you know these sort of features into Word and into yeah, Word yeah. and stuff. And like yeah. you know, um, th th that that's going to change fast because yeah. like if the, if the, the the large you know mm -hmm. mainstream office productivity tools. Yeah. do this and you know G G google has uh ha we're, we're used to yeah. um you know word by word sort of expansion yeah. in like google docs and things yeah, like yeah. that in gmail but uh but just going beyond that um, and yeah. yeah it could be really fast yeah. you know? here's a different type of skepticism i'll charge it one that does slightly resonate with me anyway like uh, mm. i think uh, kevin cannon had a funny tweet which was um he said the future is composed of people using gpt to expand upon things like i want the job and into like a lovely A4 letter, like of like, dear sir, madam, blah, blah, blah. And then the recipient 
uh, clicking the summarization button to see that Kevin, uh, that, that the original person just said, I want the job, here's my resume or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it's, and like, in some sense, you know, you, you'd be tempted to look at that and be like, what the hell is the point in all this? Like, you know, has like, um, has formal language and like, you know, professional writing and business English just become this kind of pointless conduit to a, th a theatrical way we all communicate, when in reality, maybe in the future, I'll just send you the prompt and you'll, you'll reply with your prompt, like, I want the job, you can't have the job. Yeah, uh, so I mean, uh, hard questions. This I know. Is, this is super speculative. <laughs> so I, I, I'll give some opinions. Uh, you know, there's, prob there's probably certain contexts, right? Let's say like a legal document, right? Yeah. You can go and you can say to someone in your legal team, hey, I need a contract. It's got to do like X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And like that request will turn into like, you know, 10 pages of, you know, Latin, legal basically. boilerplate and so on. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the recipient will be like, oh, does it do the three things that said it would? And their legal team will be, yes, it does. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, that's that. this is one end of the extreme where it's like, okay, this, this, this big expansion and compression there. But in some weird edge case, clause number 13 on page two can be highly material and mm -hmm. turn up in court and so on. And so like, clearly the, that matters. We, we yeah. can't get rid of, we can't just have those four bullet points. We yeah. need all that. You might not yeah. consider it material when you're writing it. Yeah. But, uh, but it may become material later. Now, that feels like one extreme where it's yeah. like, no, it kind of feels like that has to be there. Yeah. So then you deal with all those edge cases. Um, probably the other extreme is a situation where, you know, the, 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 the sender and the recipient uh, both don't care about those details. Both are mm -hmm. never going to care about those yeah. details. And they're just observing some like, you know, social graces or yeah. some formalities. Like, this is how you write a business letter. I'm mm -hmm. writing to a big company. I better write a business letter. Yeah. And uh, yeah, maybe that stuff's going to go away. Um, In the same way, I think the, mm. the analogy there for me would be like uh, when email conversations move to like SMS or iMessage or WhatsApp, think of all the shit you're not saying anymore. Like, right. you know, I hope this uh, finds you well or whatever. All that's just gone. Yeah. And it's just like, yo, any update on that? You and know, and, and you know. like Twitter, right? Like yeah. the constraints of Twitter, the, the, the format, the medium gives you permission to be more terse. And yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I think that, that, that that's a real dynamic. Um, the way we communicate, um, the way we write a help center article may yeah. not be the optimal way to write yeah. it. Maybe we should be more brief. Um, you know, the, on the machine learning team here, like the, 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 there, there's another way of, of thinking about this, um, which is that uh, the future of the world is going to be intermediated by agents. Mm -hmm. And um, once upon a time, this was obvious to everybody. Like your web browser has got like a user agent string in it and stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, it's this idea that it's, it's your agent, like going and navigating that weird internet with all yeah, these yeah. links and stuff for you and it'll do stuff for you and come back to you and tell you things and then all that stuff kind of like centralized and you know you got your search engine and so on you know but um but like for there, there is an old idea it's an idea in like tech futurism and science fiction and so on that you, you'll probably have an agent that understands you understands your intention understands what you want and is is smart enough to like figure out what to bring to your attention and what not to mm -hmm. and so like Possibly in future, the way this goes is more like that, where like, you know, if, uh, if you want to, to know a particular detail, you have software on your side that's like smart enough to put that in the summarized version of mm -hmm. it. But it's smart enough to know that you don't want to know that detail as well and to leave it out. And, you know, maybe we'll, end, maybe we'll be in some future where um, user interfaces change here, where my user interface to a particular business or a particular yeah. task it's not really controlled by that business or that task like it is today. Instead, it's like it's personalized for me. And that, that sounds very fancy, but I think that this, this is going to happen fast. Like yeah. these language models um, are very powerful. And, you know, we, we use them today to, it's starting to be used to like write code and so on. But it's a very short hop from here to like take action for me. And yeah. we, we've seen some prototypes out there um, where, you know, folks are working on models to try and like, take action, a model that like understands a website well enough to like yeah. take in an English language sentence and navigate the website for you. And then it's like, are we heading for a future where that's how everyone interacts with websites? Do you need a website anymore? Well, like is the new SEO some sort of like, make sure you make sure GPT can understand you sort of thing? Yeah, well yeah. Ma ma maybe websites turn into something that looks more like an API that's publicly yeah. exposed and less like something with UI and formatting because yeah. the UI gets formatted by the agent. Because we're all just like talking to Siri in our ear or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, yeah. I think, I think uh, you know, Google and Apple like that, that kind of built their, the, you know, the Siri and the kind of the, the, the kind of the Google uh, conversational version. Like, 
you know, they, 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 they kind of they can see this future mm-hmm. and um, the timeline. We don't know the timeline, but like if, if you're gonna if, if you're gonna ask things about like, hey, are we gonna like summarize at either end and like there'd be some intermediate thing? Yeah. Maybe and maybe maybe that's a good thing. Maybe there's some agent um, and you know that'll personalize it for you. And again, the the sort of the the thinking tool I always use is like, you know, hey, what if you had like very smart human who was like who understood you and who worked with you maybe a personal assistant or whatever and um, you were interfacing with them and you wanted to like book a holiday yeah. like what would they ask you about that yeah, yeah right and you know half the stuff you see on like booking.com or whatever they're not going to tell you that yeah and um, they're just going to go and book the holiday for you yeah. and they're going to maybe going to come back for it's like some clarifying questions oh that is like you wanted to go and stay in a self-caring apartment but there's mm-hmm. no space there Will like a you know a hotel do or whatever yeah, that yeah. might be, and um, but, but you know that that's an adaptable user interface yeah. and maybe I don't like you know again I don't focus too much on ChatGPT and on what just shipped you know when I, you know you take a year or two out it's moving mm-hmm. too fast mm-hmm. if if you're skeptical because yeah. the limitations currently you're going to move and target like yeah, even yeah. your skepticism on this market exactly exactly, exactly. Yeah. but like the direction this is going and like yeah. you know we've seen prototypes you know. Transformers are extremely powerful. Like the transformer architectures people use are extremely powerful. Like we, we've seen, you know, multiple modalities improve here. Like it, it's, you know, it'd be one thing if like all we had seen was like the DALI 2 image generation. Yeah. But like natural language processing hadn't been transformed yet. Yeah. But no, we're seeing like transformations in like, you know, audio synthesis, mm-hmm. in uh, image synthesis. And uh, text understanding, text synthesis, text compression. Like we're, we're just mm-hmm. we're seeing so many parallel advances that, like you know, code. Like it can write code. It's probably going to be able to work a website pretty mm-hmm. soon. And um, and so yeah. So maybe uh, maybe that's the answer to the question about like what's the future with bots look like? Which is that like well, we've all got a bot. We've all got an agent that's personalized yeah. to us, and they handle the interfacing. And you know, you you don't really need to worry so much about that intermediate layer most of the time. It's, I mean, one, one like obviously super proto- prototype scene I saw on Twitter was somebody who trained a bot to speak in his own voice, I believe, mm-hmm. and to call a number and navigate a banking uh, sort of phone tree effectively, get through to an agent, request to have all their like transactional uh, foreign exchange transactions refunded or something, something that's a kind of standard you just need to ask and they do it, and got all the way through to the end. And yeah. uh, and like that, and programmatically, like as in, like literally, they just said go and walked away. And that, like to me, for, was, was like obviously it was like probably super contrived, maybe super clo- closed in an environment, target rich. Right. But it was still a thing. He, you know, yeah. like as in a very real use case, end to end executed auto- automatically. So, you know, you know? We, we, I think that's it's a really interesting area. We talk a lot about how customer service will change, and where our heads always go is like. What will happen when you have a bot that's like ChatGPT, but customized to your business and yeah. like really great at answering questions? And you know, a cost of a lot of handling, a lot of customer service yeah. issues will like drop. Maybe it'll drop to zero. But there's another side to it. How will customer service change when the user has a bot that can handle customer yeah, yeah. service interactions yeah. and doesn't give up and doesn't get tired? And yeah. Um, yeah, there's potentially a, a big change there now. Like the new B2B is going to be like bot to bot, basically. <laughs> like, Maybe. Yeah, I yeah. mean, look, you know, it's uh, it might be a while before end users have that sort of tech. Yeah. It's one thing when you're demo, but uh, but yeah, it's it's an interesting thing to consider. Um, when you mentioned coding earlier, I saw like Stack Overflow. I think uh, blocked like uh, using like you know generated code or GPT code yeah. or whatever. Uh, for submissions on its website, and I've seen I've seen reactions to this from various places. I see I think like some of the online image sites, like stock photo sites, have been like not accepting it, or people have been leaning into it and saying, "Let's go, it's party time." Yeah. Um, how do you generally think about like uh, like this this double sided world world of like um, creation and ultimately like what could be seen as deception? Like this looks like a painting, but it's not a painting. It was generated yeah. uh, versus detection, like the idea that people can say, hey, this really is Des, or I really hand wrote that code. That's not generated code. How important is it is like is it for humanity to navigate this world where we're like, you know, there's a famous scene in Westworld, I think, where 
a guy wants to, you know, Westworld is a, it's a Western with robots. AI yeah, yeah. Kind of robots, it's, a recent, and, it's a remake of an old thing. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, it N- news yeah. to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sure I'll get slammed for that in the comments too. Uh, <laughs> um, Des but, didn't know it was a remake of an old thing. <laughs> but um, in Westworld is a scene where a guy bumps into a woman and he has a conversation with her. And then at the end he says, like, I have to ask, are you real? And yeah, yeah. Her yeah. response is... If you have to ask, then why does it matter? Mm. And I think that there's something there which is like, you know, it, you know, will outpacing our detection capability be seen as the definition of like authentic? Is authentic even a thing anymore? Like, so in the banking example, will how will the person say, hey, Fergal, is this actually you or is this a bot you've trained? Especially yeah. if you've trained it how to answer that question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's kind of some big questions. I'm there. looking for a one-liner here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to. I, I mean, I, 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 there's at least five questions in yeah. there. I, I, I probably lost track of. Um, yeah. Look, I mean, it's. Um, I don't know where to attack that. You know, look, you could talk about like the Turing test. Mm-hmm. Alan Turing, very smart, very prescient paper about like um, how are we going to be able to tell. Uh, when a computer has become property intelligent and then like one test was like this functional test Mm -hmm. which is like oh if a you know an intelligent educated human judge can like reliably discern between the two you know via text interface or whatever um you know then we can say it's not intelligent and when it passes that it starts to become you know we should accept it as functionally intelligent or it's misrepresented a lot but you know his paper was more like it's doing something really interesting if it mm-hmm. gets to that point. Yeah. Uh, so that, you know, that's one way of approaching things functionally. And we're past that, I would assume. Um, we? Like dare dare bets? People, you know, there's always headlines about it. Oh, something's yeah. past the Turing test. Like, you know, I think the original formulation is something like, you know, a, 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 skilled, edu- a skilled interrogator or something. We're not at that yeah, point okay, yet. Okay. Like, you yeah. know, if you, you like someone who's like, trained to ask the right questions now nah, yeah. this stuff will quickly break down it, it doesn't have the the deep world model that a human right. does and how would you feel tricky to ask like a self self-referential question you'd ask them to trip it up linguistically or uh i mean get, getting getting better and better at that sort of stuff yeah. is like winograd schemas and so on getting all the text getting better at that but it, it it's more like you know you set up like a complex domain set up like tell a story you know yeah. and um, where there's a lot going on in the story yeah. and then like you know ask it like you know some sort of complex consequential question of that right. and it'll it'll still get tripped with a load up. of red herrings in the story to yeah, to yeah. okay and yeah it, it doesn't yeah. you know like it, it'll get tripped up in a way that yeah. like a kid wouldn't yeah still. yeah gotcha but uh, you know like I think the right way to think about this is like uh, is is you're dealing with an alien intelligence you want to call it an intelligence it, you, you like it's going to be shaped differently so like yeah. there's going to be a bunch of things that a set, like, seven-year-old kid wouldn't be able to write a computer program yeah. that it'll be able to write yeah. but uh but you know it the, the, the sort of what, what you might call like the the common sense reasoning is not yeah, there yet okay. so you yeah. know uh now that said like um that's talking about you know philosophically is this mm-hmm. thing alive and sensing and stuff and like no it like I think yeah. clearly not with most definitions most people would use. Um, and like, it'd be really surprising if something with the architecture and stuff turned out to, yeah. you know, we, we, we get a real shock if, uh, but, but look, you know, that's, that's kind of veering into, into philosophy of, of AI questions. I, I would say to go, kind of comp- go back to your original point, like what if you want to build like captures for these systems? Mm-hmm. What does that look like? Um, yeah, I mean, p- people have got like ways of like watermarking and ways of detecting that like text is produced by these models. Yeah. Um, I mean, doing that happening, like, I don't know if that'll be reliable. Yeah. You know, if you have a model that's like really good at like injecting the right amount of noise to fool a watermarking thing, I don't yeah. know if that'll be reliable. Wasn't, I think Hugging Face released a thing that, that claimed to, anyway, I didn't test, that claimed to be able to generate a test if generated, uh, if GPT generated a piece of text or not. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you can you can do things like this. Like one thing I would I kind of caution anyone in this field is, you know, there's uh, there's machine learning systems and there's like how do I make my machine learning system to have good enough quality that like it'll you know hit my ninety nine percent detect image detection threshold in real life or mm-hmm. something like that. That's kind of one standard. Then there's this whole other standard which is like how do I build my machine learning system to work well compared to like adversarial input. Right, like, that's a whole different ball. Like game. Defensive design, like, defensive yeah. design. How yeah. do I defend against adversarial input? And in general, like that's really hard. And we're like, you know, if if you told me like, oh, I have a new fancy machine learning system that will like detect, 
you know, a, a fraud or detect like gar- will guard my system. It's, it's a security yeah. thing. It'll guard my system in a complex environment. I would be extremely skeptical. You, right. you, you can do you can do fraud detection. There's fraud detection systems, but like that's different from like someone is trying to attack the machine learning system, right. and uh, that we're just you know. I, I th- so I think I think like this whole issue of like detecting when you're talking to a bot. When we detect when you're talking to a large language model, when it doesn't want you to, that's going to be hard. And if we end up in a situation in the future where customer service is getting flooded by, um, you know, bots pretending to be users, that that's going to be tricky to deal with. But I don't know, you know, I imagine that for the first, you know, for for a while at least, um, you know, any big player who's got a large language model will try and stop you if you're using it for nefarious tasks like that. I think there'll be, there'll be some control there because. These models, models that are of that high quality, yeah. are um, are difficult to host and run yourself on any sort of like consumer commodity hardware. So there'll be some accountability. There. If we zoom up a bit, like, and think about, in theory, we're probably not too far away from being able to like generate plausible sounding music. Let's say like you mm. know uh, lobby music, that type of thing. Yeah, um, Muzak. Muzak, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 like to some degree, like there are general formulaic song like, this is a famous thing like you know i think some like 65 number ones have the same four chords or something like right, that right? Right, right uh or like top charting songs anyway if not number ones yeah um then obviously like uh dan brown novels all follow a similar format you know like uh doesn't mean it's bad but it's like a very like to what degree does society change when like what i would call like anything that's like expressed in some degree of uh formulaic nature um can be like replicated and ultimately it's its value can be like or you can get a zero dollar version of it it yeah. doesn't change that you know the da vinci code still the da vinci code it's a pretty good book by any normal definition um but you cannot get like the like the, the like how do you say the, the bargain basement version of it for zero dollars or for like five cent or whatever yeah and then you think that's happening across every every type of creativity again this isn't to say that that like the outputs of these technologies will be comparable but they'll be potentially like massively like one percent of the price or whatever. Yeah. Do you like how do you think the world changes in in that sort of future? So I I think you know in a lot of different ways. Um, you know you can look at analogies from the past. You can look at like painting and then photography came mm-hmm. along and suddenly like it was like easy to capture like a landscape image. But and I'm sure the painters didn't like it, right? Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't guessing, know the history well enough, but yeah. uh, but generally, the, the, generally there, there is some incumbent uh, who, who, who doesn't is like upset when there's disruption. I think this famous like um, when radio or when cassette tape was like you know live musicians were like, well, yo, this is you know, yeah, this was our gig, you know. Uh, early cinema used to have like a pianist who would like yeah. play the soundtrack, and yeah. then that went away. Yeah. Uh, gramophone and like piano tuners yeah. who used to service piano, like just you know. The, the loom and the luddites, you know, yeah, yeah. And, like the, the, there's, there's countless examples of this. Um, yeah, and I, I do think that there are areas that are like facing imminent disruption, and um, and it's going to be like hard conversations there about like, hey, what's valuable? About like, you know, what are new models by which people like produce art and like earn a living doing that and all these yeah. things. Um, look, th- th- these are like hard areas, and, and like anything like this. Um, customer support. You, you got to be sensitive. Like the, 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 you know, the. There's always like a, you know, better outcomes and worse outcomes. Like so, you know, people might say they might look at um, large language models getting better at writing code, and they might be like, hey, as a programmer, this is something close to me, right? Mm-hmm. As a programmer, uh, this valuable skill that I've invested years getting in, gosh, it's not going to be that useful anymore, and. There's different ways to think about this. You can think about it in terms of like AWS, right? We use mm-hmm. Amazon a lot at Intercom, and probably if we had to uh, do everything we did without AWS, it would cost us orders of magnitude more programmer time to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but does that mean we hire fewer programmers as a result? Well, it probably means that we wouldn't be feasible as a business mm-hmm. without that enabling tech. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, Jevons' paradox, um, sometimes making something cheaper to do means you end up doing a lot more of it. And so like, those dynamics are really hard to predict. Will there be fewer customer support representatives in a world with a lot of automation? Or will there be more? Because yeah. the value that they can bring to a business yeah. has been like magnified. And it's so like distilled almost. It's this, like this, when we take away all the real stuff, we actually see the value that they do bring, and then you're like, I want more of that. You want more yeah. of that. You need more of that. Suddenly it's like, wow, what could we unlock in terms yeah. of value to our business if we had a lot yeah. of those reps? 
And so, you know, and each one could do like 10 times more than they currently do. And so, you know, you never know. So, so I, I think that's something that gets missed sometimes. People yeah. always respond to technological disruption. They always talk about like, oh, you can, you know, climb up the value ladder and you can mm -hmm. like get a, a better job. You can become like a product manager if that's yeah. your, wherever you want to go. And, uh, and I think that, you know, that, that's one potential way it works out well. But another way is that, uh, you know, just getting much more productive at like what you yeah. currently do uh, can, can, can transform the amount of it that you need to do. Yeah. And so Or more businesses become possible because of it, right? Like, more businesses yeah. become possible. Uh, that's that's yeah. like the best thing. More, more you know, businesses just as a, a metaphor for like good things to create yeah. value for people. Yeah. More of them, which hopefully, <laughs> more, yeah. more of them, more of them become possible. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, I think this is all going to unfold with like things like um, AI art, and I, I would separate out that. Like, there's obviously there's a debate around like um, you know plagiarism and like mm -hmm. copyright infringement. If like you train yeah. someone goes and trains uh, Dali two on um, on a whole bunch of of, of pictures, yeah. was that copyright infringement? Yeah. And what if they learn the style of an artist, um, and then you ask to produce works by name? Is yeah. that copyright infringement? Yeah. There's probably a lot of stuff that that you know, legal systems and society needs to figure out there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I would say is, um, you know, one thing I think that's missing sometimes from the debate about that is even if you decide that it is copyright infringement to train the current models and that like, hey, they shouldn't have done what they were doing, um, which, you know, we don't, we don't accept that with humans. Humans are allowed to look at things and copy of course, style. Yeah. And we don't, but if we decided it was different with, with models, um, someone will still build models that are trained on like open permissible work yeah, yeah. and they'll like they're going to get pretty good at like generating yeah. images I think mean, you know that ship has sailed to a yeah. certain extent there's also that joke that like uh, if all these models are trained on is like classic works that are out of date will they actually probably be better than modern models <laughs> oh man which, I think that, yeah. that's, that's probably rough that's probably rough but you know yeah. there's, there's probably enough like public domain there's enough out there for yeah. sure um, so, yeah. to thread a few needles here you mentioned you referenced um AWS uh, as one example where we don't have a massive servers team here. We don't have like filing cabinets full of servers or whatever. Yeah. Um, is your AI team smaller because of the existence of OpenAI, Anthropic, and all that? You know, do you do you predict if if they didn't exist, would you be building an AI version of the server team? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's that's a hell of a question. Um, Thanks. <laughs> The, so like, there's different ways of looking at it, right? So it's just been um, a new, yeah. So like, is the AI team getting disrupted? And you know, we, we've uh, we've gone back and forth in this, right? Mm -hmm. So like, there is an extent to which let, let's imagine like let's just look at the current version of large language models. Like I was I was playing with um, with like GPT recently as like a movie recommender. It's like, hey, mm -hmm. I like watching like X and Y. Like, can you suggest me something? Mm -hmm. And like. It's not bad. It doesn't give you like, it's not like, I'm sure it's not as good as like a really well tuned, you know, recommended that's got like all the best data, but it's doing a lot better than like randomly picking movies. And it'll output like, it'll spit out like it's reasoning and it's reasoning like everything it does is plausible. Mm -hmm. but it's not bad. And like, so again, even if that, if that tech's not great now, um, I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't be rushing out to productize a movie recommender from it or anything. Yeah. But, what if it gets 10 times better or yeah. 100 times better? What if you just feed it, you yeah. know, way more training data or, or just way better training regime? Just wait for GPT-4. Yeah, whatever. GPT-6, yeah. whatever, like, yeah. whatever that looks like, right? Whatever $10 yeah. billion dollars buys you of compute yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and reinforcement and human feedback. Um, if that is, in fact, the, <laughs> what happened. Um, what if that happens? Like, do you still go and build a recommender system? Yeah. If someone asks you for a recommender system, do you go do that or do you just like, is it, you know, OpenAI, Sam Altman has, has given talks where like, like, hey, imagine we could get this to be human level. Yeah. Like, if you had a, a, you know, something that was human level general intelligence, mm -hmm. do you need a machine learning team anymore? Yeah. Or do you just like sit down and be like, hey, hi, how's it going? Today, I'm going to teach you how to be a movie recommender. Mm -hmm. And you've got to give it lots of examples. And it's got to be able to consume a data set about movies. But Maybe it's maybe maybe it's just like, hey, AI system, write the code yeah. to consume the data set about movies. I, I I don't know, and and you know, you're getting into big questions there about like yeah. you're really pushing for a lot of big questions here today. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe that's just where where all our heads are going at the moment. 
we get getting into like big yeah. questions about like you know if by the time that's disrupted yeah. uh what percentage of current human economic activity is disrupted is, yeah totally fair and but maybe maybe that, that that's a very bullish case maybe, maybe we hit like some asymptote before then yeah um, and certainly, I don't think we're near to that point at the moment. I think so you still, still need machine learning. I was going to say you're still looking for your headcount. Is basically yeah, the yeah, point. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I think, uh, and I think, um, I think we're certainly in this uh, happy Jevons paradox style place for yeah. for like a while, where it's like, oh wow, a lot of stuff is unlocked, and maybe we're doing slightly different work than we were before. We're certainly doing a lot more prompt engineering, mm-hmm. um, but uh, but we're also we're having these systems are not yet good enough to just to, to like just train just with, bank on them. Yeah, yeah. You can't outsource the whole thing to OpenAI and feel like they'll they'll solve our problems. First. Right. Yeah. yeah. And certainly not yet. And yeah. I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't. I really hesitate to speculate about when. I just give you one like super concrete limitation. There's um, you know, all these models have like a prompt size. Mm-hmm. And so like the amount of context that you can pass to it with a prompt is is limited. Right. And uh, that that's like that's that. That limit is like baked in mm-hmm. pretty low down, it's sort of like a hardware style basis. So, like, you know, there's a lot of art and work, a lot of stuff the team is doing at the moment is around like, hey, how do we work around that? How do we like give them the, a relevant article? And we're using like more traditional machine learning techniques, you know, traditional being like, you know, invented like five years ago. Yeah, Whatever yeah, classic old. Like yeah, yeah. The classic stuff. From Back like, when we were know. writing with pen and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, and you know, so like, I think there's, there's, there's tons of opportunity with like the marriage of like this yeah. new capability uh, for specific things it's good at, with like a lot of scaffolding and a lot of product work around that. Yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, there will be disruption, and I, I, I believe, uh, and I think that this feels like extremely disruptive tech to me, particularly okay. when you project a few years out. Mm-hmm. Um, but but we we don't know how big it'll be yet. I don't think anyone knows how big it'll be yet. Yeah. Maybe, maybe the folks in OpenAI do, but I don't. I would kind of say that there's probably nobody who knows how good. If if you put like hundred x more resources into like model training mm-hmm. or data set creation or whatever, like what return do you get? Is it like ten x, a hundred x, a thousand x? I don't yeah. know if anyone knows that. Certainly, there's no consensus on it. And maybe individual people feel they have a pretty good idea. There was that quote from Sam Altman where he, where he was asked something about, I think it was like some irrelevant question about like challenges in San Francisco or, or, or something like that. And his, his answer was, when you when you believe that you know artificial general intelligence is as close as I do, you yeah. struggle to think about any other problem. And I think like that that was a, when I read that, I was like, okay, well, he certainly is like, you know, Lent a certain way now. He could he could still be thinking twenty years, but it just means yeah. that like some societal problems are kind of irrelevant against the greater potential wave of what could be happening here. Yeah. Um, so full disclaimer mode on here yeah. now. Um, yeah, I, I I think there's a lot of merit to to that style of thinking yeah. personally. I I think that um, you know it's I, I remember the it was like there was times in in the history of computation when it's like oh if you got like a million dollars to solve a computing problem. And you need to solve it as soon as possible. What you need to do is like sit in the million dollars for two years and then buy the fastest computer that a million yeah. dollars can do. <laughs> yeah. and like that will be faster than what you'll do in the, inter- you know. Do, do, yeah, yeah, yeah. This I is- mean, I remember like in my own career, this is like a very boring example, but like 2006, 2007, mobile websites were all the thing pre iPhone, right? And people were talking about like, you know, uh, uh, WAP, you know, the old uh, yeah, mobile yeah. protocol. There was like JMI files or Genie files and iPhones. And everyone like had to have their mobile strategy. And literally by the time I finished working out like what I thought was the right recommendation for a client, uh, like the iPhone had launched. And I was like, you know what, just don't worry about it. Sit in your hands. Apple's going to solve this entire problem. And sure enough, like two months later, like, hey, it turns out our we- all our websites are mobile ready. Like yeah. sometimes a tech wave can be so big yeah. that it actually, what any temporal thing you do will just be irrelevant against the magnitude of what's going to happen here. I mean, yeah. And so if you believe AGI is close, um, I, I guess I can logically see that position. Now, clearly it seems like there's a, a terrible mistake to make there where, <laughs> yeah, you know, where you're wrong. <laughs> you, you're wrong. And like, you know, you, you, you have just been sitting on your hands. You've given yourself a license to like, mm-hmm. Ignore terrible, terrible things, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and like so, you know, you, you, yeah. you obviously you got to. I'm not not making any judgment on that. 
Uh, but uh, but yeah, obviously you got, you got clearly there's a pitfall there to avoid yeah. and an attractive pitfall to fall into. Um, yeah, look, I, I think uh, I think it's very hard to bet against um, increasing increasingly general intelligence. Yeah. Um, I I don't know like timelines and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I would I would, like I I think that there are. Yeah, it's big questions for people to think yeah. about there. And that's definitely yeah. like way outside yeah, of no, like it's, it's, customer support. Customer no, service. totally. Yeah, it's it's yeah. like UBI, it's currency, it's growth, global economic trade. It's yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, and we'll save that for the next one. Yeah, podcast. I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Cool. Well, look, thank you very much. I'm sure we'll check in in six weeks to find out that this whole podcast has yet again been out of date. Out of date. Uh, we'll see yeah. where we're at again. Cool. But for now, thank you very much. Thanks.